Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture series for the Law of Equity and Trust. My name is Aibu Kaya and today we are going to be looking at our second chapter which is the maxims of equity. This chapter builds from our previous uh, seminar which was um, uh, the historical background of equity and how equitable remedies are applied in court today. I welcome you to this lecture series where we'll be looking at specific maxims and trying to breathe life into those maxims for easy understanding on how they are employed in court to award a remedy to the plaintiff. So welcome and let us now dive deeper into each maxims uh, one at a time. So our first maxim here is uh, the equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. This particular maxim means that uh, equity will try to ensure that the plaintiff gets a remedy in a court of law, which uh, may not have been possible with use of um, common law uh, or a statutory uh, remedies, which are very strict uh, to some extent uh, and limited to a specific uh, remedy. Um, previously, before the introduction of equity and law of trust, we had a very limited number of remedies that could be provided under the common law. Mostly damages was uh, uh, the remedy which was uh, given as a compensation for harm which has been occasioned on a plaintiff. However, through the introduction of equity, it is, seems that the equity is flexible and looks at beyond what has just been documented that uh, or written down as the specific a way of awarding of relief in court. Uh, in fact, we have even uh, remedies which may be awarded by way of equity on anticipatory uh, injuries which may occur on the plaintiff. Uh, remedies like anticipatory injunction or promissory estoppel are some of those reliefs that a court uh, may award as uh, equitable remedies when a plaintiff who has suffered harm. Such uh, remedies were not previously recognized through the common law mechanisms. And also some of these remedies that equity introduced were not recognized within the written laws. So equity ten, ten uh, tends to um, be flexible to the extent that if someone has suffered a harm, there should be at least a remedy to that extent. However, it goes without saying that not all harm suffered by a plaintiff can be um, remedied through the mechanisms of equity. Now, we will... Uh, now proceed to the, the second maxim, which is uh, um, he who seeks equity must do equity. This maxim provides that uh, if a plaintiff is approaching the court, it itself must be ready to also be uh, able to fulfill the requirements of equity. So equities, equity will not uh, tolerate a party who is the plaintiff coming to court and does not uh, wish to be fair to the other uh, party, the defendant. So the equity will try to stop such kind of a party and looks at this uh, both parties to be remedied through the equity. So the equity will not blind itself on one end at the um, 
at the cost of another party. So equity will tend to offer relief only where it is fair to both parties, the defendant and the plaintiff at the same time. There is this famous case which is called Davis versus Duke, uh, which is an 1819 case where the court uh, categorically stated that the, the, the principle of this court is not to give a relief to those who will not do equity. So that means that if the plaintiff himself is trying to get the remedy in court, must also be prepared to follow the uh, steps of being uh, fair and do equity to the other party as well. Now, this maxim is quite different from the one which says that he who comes to equity must come with a clean hands. The previous uh, uh, maxim which is uh, he who seeks equity must do equity, looks at the future uh, dealings between the parties when determining that dispute, as opposed to this uh, maxim which says that he who comes to equity must come with a clean heart. With this maxim, if you're approaching the court you must have you yourself as the plaintiff done what is at your best in with the honesty and also you have been fair to the other party in your own rights. So if you come to court pleading for the court to award you remedy uh, through equitable means, you must also be ready to you must have actually like come to court when you were in position to demonstrate that you have not wronged the other party now let's say for example you committed fraud on someone and that person uh, also did harm to you Maybe you conceal some information or perhaps you had a misrepresentation for specific um, uh, in a specific contract. If you had such kind of misrepresentation, it means you're approaching the court with the dirty hands and the court will not uh, give you remedy if you are seeking recourse on a contract which has been violated by a defendant. So if you approach the court and you yourself had a problem which occasioned to the violation of that particular contract, then the court is likely to rely on, on this maxim that he who comes to equity must come with clean hands to deny you of any remedy or recourse in that regard. Now we let's look at uh, the other maxim, which is maxim number four, uh, which is delay defeats equity. Under this maxim, the court requires that uh, a person who is seeking a uh, remedy in court, of course, who is the plaintiff, must take necessary steps within a reasonable period of time to make their claim. If they do not do so, then the doctrine of latches may fall on them. This doctrine of um, latches, it is a doctrine which looks at the time limitations. So how much time has lapsed since when you are supposed to approach the court to give you remedy on this? In Kenya, we have this uh, doctrine of latches uh, fulfilled under the statutory uh, 
Ma Act on Limitations of Actions, Act Cap Number 28, Laws of Kenya, which provides on specific uh, durations under which one must have uh, launched or uh, ready to seek recourse through the court of law. So if it is uh, uh, limited to six months, if it's limited to two years, one must make endeavors to seek recourse within that uh, particular time frame. So if you delay for a very long period of time, uh, then equity may not uh, offer you um, recourse if your delay will occasion um, harm or will prejudice uh, uh, the other party. So the court may be very apprehensive in awarding you a, a, a remedy which you seek if you delayed to take action uh, with regard to the harm occasioned to you by the defendant. <clears throat> now, we also have this maxim that equity is equity. And this follows the, uh, the doctrine of fairness that equity will always be fair to both parties. This does not, however, mean that equity must look at it as equal, which is uh, maybe 50-50 kind of share, uh, sharing of burden. However, it looks at how much burden is it equitable for this particular party uh, to shoulder in with regards to the case which has been advanced. There is this um, uh, a proverb which says that uh, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So how much share do we say that this is enough for Caesar and how much can we say that this uh, is a, in a fraction which it rightfully uh, is for or is, it should be deserved to be given for God. So you have to make that balance that you cannot give another person a bigger shoulder than they are supposed to receive in terms of uh, shouldering of the blame. <clears throat> so equity is always equity. So you look at it in terms of if we measure it fairly, who deserves to share how much of the blame or of uh, how much um, of the or how much of uh, the blame should we elevate from a particular a party? So all that will be done by the court assessing uh, based on the individual faults in each individual cases because each case are always very different and unique on its own way. So um, with uh, this particular maxims on equity is equity where the two or more persons also claim to the interest of a particular property and has not been put down on how much per share each may take, then the court sometimes it presumes that uh, we may have to go 50-50. That is the only time when 50-50 share kind of burden, it comes in play. If the parties have made a representation that for this particular transaction, we are going to shoulder our um, our obligations 50-50 kind of share, but it does not necessarily mean that at all point it will always be 50-50 because the court will try to be uh, to play to, to weigh both on the scale to see where do we put this amount of blame and where do we elevate this kind of blame uh, for it to award this uh, remedies. We also have another 
equitable maxim, which is uh, equity will not assist a volunteer. Now, with regards to this uh, 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 maxim principle, it uh, looks at the equity not granting any remedy to a person who um, who gave their promise gratuitously without providing for an a consideration in terms of um, fulfilling a contractual obligation. So if a party has not provided for consideration or a party is not has not made it um, to be known to the other party of what is expected of them to perform that particular obligation, then the equity will not come in if you did a particular task or you did a particular transaction without uh, putting in mind or consideration that you will require the other party also to fulfill the other part of the bargain. So if you did not do that, then you are deemed to have made this promise gratuitously, voluntarily, and without uh, a requirement of a party to fulfill on the other end. So if you voluntarily did it uh, to, to, to perform a particular contractual obligation without necessarily requiring the other party to also act on the other end, then equity will not assist you um, on that not uh, we will now move to another maxim which is equity regards that as done which ought uh, to be done with this maxim where there is a specifically an enforceable contractual obligation, equity regards the parties as ready being in position which they will be in following the performance of that particular obligation. So if a party was supposed to have fulfilled a specific, uh, if parties are supposed to fulfill a specific um, enforceable obligation, then equity will regard that, yes, they are supposed to have fulfilled that obligation. So that is the specific obligation which this party has to ensure that they fulfill. So if the court is uh, enforcing or even pushing for them to fulfill that particular uh, obligation through specific performance, they'll be looking at it like you are supposed, for example, to give uh, Mr. So and so, this parcel of land, yet you did not do so. So the obligation here is give that specific uh, parcel if the agreement was for that uh, specific uh, property. So if you look at the end game, what did these parties ought uh, or want or wish to be part of that? contractual obligation. So they will look at it as an end game for that uh, particular uh, transaction. In the landmark case of uh, Walsh versus Londell, or the case of 1882, the seven-year lease was granted to the tenant, but no deed was executed. The court uh, found that the legal fixed term of that lease, which was the end game of that property, was made that binding contract to create that seven-year lease. So they looked at what was the end game, what was the party's intention as the final result was the seven-year lease. So the court went for that seven-year lease. So the, it will it will regard what what was to be done 
as it has already been done. So that's what the intention of the parties was, to make their lease to go for seven years. So the court would deem it for seven years. And if a party in between is trying to propose that uh, we should terminate the seven-year kind of lease, then the court will not uh, accept such kind of uh, argument. Let's now look at uh, equity does not allow a statute to be used as an instrument of fraud. This maxim uh, descends uh, from the direction of not having those obstacles. We're trying to remove those formalities. We're trying to remove those uh, strict and rigid common law doctrines or which existed then, which forced parties to comply with those statutory formalities. Now, and um, we have another form I mean another maxim which also says that the equity will not uh, uh, look at formalities themselves. So if it's just a matter of uh, statutory formalities, like for example, today in Kenya, we have that statutory uh, caveat that uh, when you're doing a transaction on land, it must be documented. It must be written. And some of those statutory requirements, they have specific format that you have to follow. Maybe there's a specific form to fill uh, where parties will put the particulars in specific order. However, this maxim looks at it this way. Now, in as much as the law has provided for this uh, kind of formalities, it should not be a hindrance to a party to receive justice and fairness in court. So equity will blind itself uh, to some extent to those statutory um, formalities so that that statutory instrument is not used uh, to defraud the other party and say, no, there was no written agreement. And as such, then we cannot say there was a contractual obligation or there was a contract for sale of land or a particular um, a particular uh, property. So in that regard, equity will step in to prevent a party from relying on the instrument of the law to say that we uh, did not anticipate uh, this contract to be a formal contract for its lack of statutory formalities. Another uh, maxim here uh, is uh, equity acts in personam. This maxim uh, looks at uh, who can this court uh, uh, like tailor these orders against. So can the court order, uh, for example, a, a specific body, can it order, um, can it order a group of individuals which are not a party to this uh, uh, dispute, the answer is no. So the court will only use this maxim when they are uh, awarding specific orders uh, on a specific uh, party. And most of the time, of course, is the defendant. So if the court says they have awarded, or, or rather they are giving an order, for, for a party not to institute specific uh, action against another party, it is not to that court where they are instituting that, uh, uh, that case, but rather on as an individual party. So it goes on a person. The order is against the, the defendant. Uh, also, equity enforces its powers against persons in its jurisdiction, regardless of whether it relates to the property which is situated abroad. So it must be within their own jurisdiction that you are um, 
giving these orders to a specific person within your jurisdiction. Now, it goes without saying that uh, the court is a supervisor that of uh, enforcement of those orders. So if a court issues uh, an order, it must be in position to supervise uh, the compliance of those orders and the possible content of those uh, court orders. So if a court is issuing an order of an injunction to a stop to stop a party from acting or forcing a party to act in a certain way, then it must be in position to uh, monitor the compliance of those orders on that specific person. So it is basically that equity will only act on that person whose, um, which the court has issued that specific order on them. Let's now move to the next uh, maxim, which is equity will not perfect an imperfect gift. Now, this maxim has a small relation, or rather close relation, with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the previous maxim that we talked about, which is uh, uh, equity will not assist a volunteer. Now, with this, we regard a gift as a perfect gift if it has followed specific uh, requirements for it to be transferred to another person. So the transfer of title of a particular property can only be deemed to be sufficient if that uh, title is flowing from the donor and going to the recipient of that particular gift having followed the specific requirements of uh, that transfer of that legal title. Now, if you do not have the title to transfer a particular property to another person, you cannot be deemed uh, to have sufficient requ requirements to transfer that title because a title cannot be transferred by its owner. Also, if, for example, um, giving, gifting somebody uh, maybe a, a section or part of my property uh, through a will, I will have to follow specific ways on requirements of a will for me to gift a person uh, this particular uh, gift. So without following such kind of uh, an order, the court will not come in to assume my intentions, me as a donor, and say, oh, they intended to gift you just uh, this kind of um, uh, gift. Now, that may be in the aspect of how much in terms of quantity did I specific, specify which property I'm supposed to give to this uh, recipient. Did I specifically uh, also uh, show um, to what extent uh, I'm gifting them this particular gift. So if I have not followed those requirements, then it's deemed that equity will not assist me in perfecting the gift which I gave to another person if that gift was defective and did not follow the required procedures or requirements. Now, um, we move to the next uh, maxim, which is equity follows the law. This maxim uh, specifically shows that uh, equity may not depart from uh, a statutory requirements. So, in as much as we have equity as a, a law, and uh, it is working in hand in hand with the uh, statutory laws and also the common law does not mean that it's opposing those other uh, legal requirements. What equity does is to supplement the law, to supplement the common law or the statutory uh, legal provisions. 
but does not come to destroy it, uh, the law. So it will only come in to fulfill the aspects of the law. However, where the law is not uh, specifically uh, providing for direction, equity may come in. Or where the law or the common law is so rigid, also equity may come in to, uh, to provide a redress for that illegal wrong. Uh, so equity will not depart from the law itself and say now we let us shelve the law aspect, we let us shelve the common law aspect, but it comes in as a, a matter of supplementary uh, legal mechanism to provide remedy to the plaintiff. Now, we also have a maxim where, uh, which says that uh, where the equities are equal, the law prevails. So we may have two maxims which are uh, applicable in a specific uh, situation. So where are two maxims in like some of the maxims, of course, that we're mentioning here, where there are two of them, they can easily be applicable and they are all uh, locking horns. We can always uh, depart from them and now use the law to uh, find the solution to which one can be applicable or if we should depart from them completely. So the law will provide the guidance in that regard. So the law will prevail where the two equities, they are equal and we are unable to pick one of them. And if so choosing eight of the two uh, equal maxims or the two equitable remedies will uh, render injustice to either of the party. So the law will come in to help equity to provide that justice to the parties. Um, so this only happens where there are competing interests or rights on the same item of the property or um, uh, specific legal uh, requirements. So and let's move to another maxim. So we have um, another maxim which says that where equities are equal, the first in time prevails. So if we have two maxims that are equal, if we are not only like using the law itself to separate the two of them, then we will deem the one which is the first in time prevails. What does this mean? Um, it means that the maxims, the, the, uh, the party whose issue came first with that specific maxims applicable on their issue or their defense will be considered first as opposed to the other uh, party whose issue or their maxim, applicable maxim came later. This does not mean that we have a date of uh, emergence of specific maxim, that we have maxim A today or has been constituted. Now we have maxim B. Now we'll assume and go to maxim A that came earlier. No, that's not how it applies. We apply this by looking at the parties, how they've approached the court. The first person might, might have come with, uh, with uh, an aspect saying, that he who comes to equity might come, must come with the clean hands. And then the another person has come up with uh, another maxim, which is similar or closer related to that particular maxim. Then we say, the one who came first with this will prevail. So lastly, we also have a maxim which says that equity looks to the intent rather than the form. I had uh, mentioned this earlier in this uh, chapter uh, when I was 
uh, discussing other equitable maxim. And I stated that equity does not look at those defects of the formalities. Those formalities, uh, the form it is often how parties are supposed to do some things in a specific way, if benefit has been put under the statutory provision, we may not say that uh, that is the final uh, way on how we can apply that particular um, maxim. So if, for example, the law has provided for a specific way on how to provide a form uh, in relation to transaction on matters of land that you're supposed to have these formalities, and yet the parties did not go fully into it, then equity will depart from its form and look at what did this party intend? What did these two parties intend to have their contractual uh, obligations? So it will depart from the formalities and then looks at the intent of the parties. So it is uh, deemed uh, to be that equity looks at the substance rather than the form it itself. And with that, we are at the end of this uh, topic on the maxims of equity. Our next lecture will be on equitable remedies and we will be starting with injunction and then we we'll go to other equitable remedies like uh, restitution. Uh, we'll also look at specific performance and we'll look at uh, uh, estoppel and other remedies uh, that equitable remedies uh, provide are provided for under the law of equity. With that, uh, thank you very much and let us meet in the lecture series with any questions that arises out of this lecture module.